I wanted to make a video about what I learned the first two weeks of owning my benchtop milling machine, which in this case is a Precision Matthews PM25MV. I got the milling machine before I went to school for it, and so I learned some stuff. The one thing I learned was that at your local rental yard, you can rent what's called a beam lifter, and it makes it real easy to install the mill instead of using a cherry picker and wrapping a strap around it. If you rent a beam lifter, which costs about $65, you can just have two guys lift it up on there and it makes it just incredibly easy for two guys to install it, to get the 295 pound mill up on the stand there without risking hurting your back. Another thing I learned was that the T-nuts that come with this mill are too large. And so when you go to mount your bench vise, you need smaller T-nuts. I bought a 52 piece clamping kit at the same time I bought this mill and that included the correct T-nuts which happened to be um, half inch. The slots in the table for the T-slots are 12 millimeter but you can use half inch T-nuts and I also found some on eBay and you'll need 3 8 inch hardware for that. So it's standard hardware not metric. So I found myself at the hardware store buying some 3 8 bolts and washers to get my bench vise onto the table or anything else you might want to clamp into the T-slots. Another thing I learned was the location of the locks. For example, the spindle lock and the X, Y, and Z axes locks. The spindle lock is located here. That will if it's unlocked, you can have the spindle go up and down. If it's locked, the spindle's locked. The x-axis locks are here. And by the way, you want to be careful not to have this lever in the way when you're having the z-axis come in and out, because I have hit the lever up against that. So that's where the x-axis lever locks are. The z-axis lever locks are located behind the motor control unit that you can't see from this angle, and I apologize for that, but they're back there. The y-axis lever locks are located down here, and those can also get in the way of this bolt, so you want to be careful when you're cranking the z-axis back and forth that the y-axis lever locks don't get hung up on this bolt. So that's where the axis lever locks are located. Another thing I learned that when I got this milling machine was that the DRO came set to metric, and I'm in the United States, so I wanted thousands so that was an easy fix just to hit this millimeters inches that's where that button is another thing that i want to talk about is the power feed kit and that's kind of a long discussion um, i was real excited to get my mill going and i budgeted four hours with two guys to install the power feed kit and we did fail in that endeavor on that Saturday afternoon. With this power feed kit, you need to be prepared to either drill and tap your saddle to mount the limit switch or modify the bracketry for the limit switch. At the end of the video, I'll show some pictures of how I modified the bracketry because I chose not to drill and tap my saddle. I chose to use the two pre-existing tapped holes that are, were in there for a zero dial. And so I modified both brackets that were supplied with the kit so that I could use those holes. The bracket that comes with the kit here is too long, so you could just cut it, but I cut it and re-welded it. And then the other bracket that's behind it, again, there's pictures of my modified brackets at the end, that bracket had to be cut down so that it wouldn't get in the way of things. One thing is it blocks the ball oiler there. Also, this part of the power feed kit blocks the ball oiler here for the Y-axis hand wheel, but that's not a big deal because you can always just bypass the ball oiler and just lubricate the ways directly. And that goes for any ball oiler. One more thing I have to say about the ball oilers is they press in. They don't thread in, they press in. Because I did have one jiggle out and I learned that 
uh, to install a ball oiler, which you can buy from Precision Matthews. For this machine, the ball oilers are six millimeter. They just press in. Continuing talking about the power feed unit, I was complaining to Precision Matthews how the bracketry supply didn't just bolt right on, and they said, well, you might need to modify the bracketry a little bit or drill and tap your saddle, but you're really gonna to wanna to have an X-axis power feed on your benchtop milling machine, and I did find that to be true. So I like having the X-axis power feed. And still talking about the power feed, I, I broke this bracket here when I was installing it by tightening these bolts too much. And maybe my friend did it by tightening these bolts, but one of us tightened one of these bolts too much and it cracked this bracket, which is cast aluminum. This is another bracket here, which is presumably cast aluminum. And it adjusts up and down to adjust the engagement of the teeth on the drive here. Now I use Loctite on these bolts to mount this bracket to the table, and I can still get my T-nuts in here, just barely. So I use Loctite here, I use blue Loctite. I did not use blue Loctite here because if you want to, it's very easy to adjust the engagement of the drive gear teeth by loosening these bolts and raising this up and down. I have mine set down a lot so that I'll have good engagement for the power feed. The cost I pay for that is it's a little hard to turn the hand wheel. If I make sure this is unlocked and I turn the hand wheel, it's a little hard to turn because that is engaged all the time. So again, making sure the x-axis is unlocked, I'll demonstrate the power feed. It's got the rapid switch and it has a potentiometer here. Go real slow. This is off. This is that direction. Then it stops. And then this is this direction. And then it has a power switch here if you just want to completely turn off the power feed unit. Let's see if I had anything, everything I wanted to say about the power feed kit. The power feed kit, it took me about 12 hours of labor to install it. Now that I know what I'm doing, I could do that in less, but if, if you get a power feed kit, and I hope you do, save a lot of time to modify the bracketry or drill and tap your saddle, because it's gonna take a while to get the power feed kit on there, and certainly don't over tighten these bolts. Just tighten them up enough to where they'll hold. This is real secure like it is, and I didn't tighten it very tight. And remember that it's very easy to adjust this up and down to make that hand wheel easier to turn. Final thing I have to say about the power feed kit is this dust cover. A lot of people don't use the dust cover and you don't need to, but I relieved the back of it. I filed a slot in the back of it, which you can't see, but I'll splice in some pictures at the end of the video of the relief I made so that it goes down so that there's room between the hand wheel and the bottom of the vise. Because if I turn this like this, there's just barely enough room there for the limit switch to be over the y-axis hand wheel. And then you can see it's just under the swivel for the vise. So that limit switch is a little tall. And if you don't use a dust cover, you'll have plenty of room. And now apparently I'm still talking about the power feed kit. It has these stops, which have plungers which hit the limit switch to turn it off so you don't damage your mill because this part here would crash into your base and you don't want that at all. One thing to note when you buy the power feed kit is that there's some slide in T-nuts here that need to be ground or filed to fit. And that takes a while and you don't want to file them down too much otherwise it'll be loose of course, you're gonna file them down enough to fit in there. And I lubricated a little for these dovetails. So that's all I have to say about the power feed kit. Worth having, might take longer than you think to install it. Moving down my list of things I learned in the first two weeks that I owned this mill, I already mentioned how the X-axis hand wheel is a little hard to turn with the power feed. And like I've already said, if that bothers you, just 
loosen this bolt and this bolt and raise this a little bit and it'll be easier to turn the hand wheel. And I'm sure your power feed would still work. I don't mind the forearm workout. And I already said that the x-axis power feed is a must-have because you're moving your workpiece out, moving it back in, and get a better surface finish. And you know, how much do you want to crank the x-axis hand wheel? You're already cranking the z-axis and the y-axis hand wheel enough. Another thing I want to talk about that I learned because I didn't know about it was the engage disengage for the spindle travel for the fine control. This is the fine up and down for the spindle. The spindle, it's locked right now. Here I am unlocking it. It moves up and down two inches like a drill press. And if you want to use the fine control, like right now, it's not doing anything because it's not engaged. So to engage it, it'll push in. And if you go like that, it'll push it in. And when you turn it, Oh, I see it's not engaged. So I need to get it engaged. Now, when I use the fine control, it goes up and down like this. And you don't want to have that engaged all the time. So to disengage it, when you loosen this, this handle will pop out a bit. And now you can use this like you would on a drill press. And this right now, because this is disengaged, the fine control doesn't do anything. My next point is that you must install the drawbar when you get this mill. It comes with two drawbars, which was a nice surprise. Both the drawbars that they send are identical, so you find yourself with an extra drawbar. And when I installed the drawbar, I noticed that there was a set screw here, which is accessed by bringing this down. There's a slot here, and inside the slot, there's a set screw, which has a 2.5 millimeter hex key, and this is all in the manual. What that set screw does is it defines the, the key for your R8 collet, and when this machine came, that set screw was in too far, so when I went to install the drawbar, when I put the R8 collet in, I couldn't tighten the drawbar enough, so I had to back off the set screw so that I could put the R8 collet in enough so I could thread it and install the collet. And at that point, I tightened the set screw a little bit, but not too much, otherwise it would clamp onto the collet. What that set screw does, my understanding, is it defines the, the key slot for your collet. The other thing I learned is how to calculate the RPM that you need. Because I was so excited to use my mill and I haven't been to school yet, and I didn't know at all what RPM to choose. So I went on YouTube and I found, the second and third video I found explained it well. And what I learned was that, first of all, you find the surface feet per minute. Now this cutting tool is high speed steel. I got it in a kit from little machine shop. It has four flutes and it's high speed steel cutting mild steel. The value that I use for that is 100 surface feet per minute, which is relating to the material, which is mild steel, and the fact that this is high speed steel. So you get 100 surface feet per minute for high speed steel cutting tool on mild steel. The formula is surface feet per minute times 3.82 divided by the diameter of the cutting tool in inches will give you your RPM. In this case, what I have on the machine is 100 surface feet per minute, which I've already explained, times 3.82 divided by 0.75 inches, which is the diameter of this end mill, and it gives you 509.33. So starting point for the RPM would be 509 RPM. A lot of people just say 100 times 4 divided by the diameter of the cutting tool in inches. This is for steel. You'll have different values for aluminum or brass or titanium or stainless or delrin or bronze. Now I want to talk about the ball oilers.
the x-axis power feed kit does block two ball oilers. It blocks the one here, which lubricates the x-axis hand wheel on the lead screw, and it blocks the ball oiler here, which is the y-axis hand wheel lead screw lubrication. That's not a big deal because you just look at the ball oiler and you think, what is it lubricating? In this case, you can get in there and lubricate the ways or the lead screw. Same with this one. You can lubricate the lead screw or the ways. You can get in there with your oiler and lubricate anything you want. So you don't need to use the ball oilers. I did have a ball oiler fall out and I called Precision Matthews and they sell ball oilers in either six millimeter or eight millimeter. This machine uses six millimeter ball oilers. And what I learned was that these just install by pressing them in. They don't screw in. If one comes out for whatever reason, say vibration, you just get a new one and just press it in. And that's it. So here's the tooling that I bought so far for my milling machine. You know, I bought a milling machine and a lathe and that took up a lot of my money. I did the whole thing on a credit card and I, at this point, I don't have any money for any metrology equipment. So this is the 52 piece clamping kit that I got from Precision Matthews. It's 3 8 inch uh, hardware. Here's my large V blocks that I got from Grizzly. It was about $60 or both, because I work with thin walled tubing a lot. This is my 11 piece collet set, R8 collets, that I bought with a milling machine. This comes from Precision Matthews. I did order a chuck, which is still on its way. This is a parallel set, which I needed right off the bat. And I was confused about how to find a parallel set, because I'd go on Amazon, and for some reason I was attracted to the negative reviews, and people said they were awful. I ended up using the recommendations from Blondie Hacks on YouTube, the stuff she was using, because she seems to know what she's doing, so I bought the stuff that she had. This is my high-speed steel end mill set. I don't know when I'm going to ever use the two flute ones, because I usually work on steel and aluminum and titanium, which would include chromoly. So I don't even know why I bought the two flute, but that was a set she recommended. And maybe I'll find myself working on brass or Delrin one day. This is the extra draw bar that came with the milling machine, which I was really happy about. This is a solid machine piece. That's a shoulder. It's not a collar that's machined on there. It's machined. And this is the toolkit that comes with the milling machine. It includes an extra handle and just various hardware. This is the, and they sent me some hex keys and now I see there's some T-nuts. These T-nuts are oversized. They come with, I guess they expect you to have larger T-slots. This is what I use for the, um, to install the draw bar. It doesn't work very well. I tried to find a socket, a female socket, but I can only find a male socket. So I'm still looking for a female socket. I'm not sure what that is. If it's a 11 or 12 millimeter, I'm not sure. This is a spindle lock handle. And then I picked up some of these. These are going to be ground down before they fit in the dovetails on the outside of the table. So we're calling those sliding T-nuts. I got those on eBay. And then this is the oiler that comes with the PM kit. I filled it with three-in-one oil because I hadn't seen the manual yet of what sort of oil to use. And how I use this, trying to find a ball oiler here. I imagine everyone knows how to use a ball oiler, but this is how I do it. Make sure this is unlocked. Something like that. Obviously I'd move that out of the way. Uh, going back to the power feed kit, he 
You can't really see my modifications, but when you get the power feed kit, you're going to want to really be patient and be prepared to either tap your saddle or modify the brackets that come with the kit. I didn't feel like tapping my saddle, even though PM recommended tapping the saddle. If you tap the saddle, these two bolts would bolt into your saddle. And this limit switch kind of almost gets in the way. The dust cover, a lot of people don't use the dust cover. I relieved the back of it, which I'm afraid you can't see, but I filed out a relief on the back of it and I modified the brackets a lot and I'll splice in a picture of that. It took a bit of work. When PM sends a kit, these, this bracket here is too long. So you have to cut it and I cut it and re-weld it. You could just cut it, but I cut it and re-welded it. And the bracket back here that I'm gonna edit in pictures of my modifications it has to be ground down a lot because it obstructs the ball oiler. And I ended up bolting my brackets to the uh, existing threaded holes that were used for a zero indicator. And I'll splice in a picture of that. So that's my PM25 mil, what I learned the first two weeks of owning it, and I really like it. Thanks for watching.